Hey guys. So my name is Jessica and I'm the executive producer at Equilateral. Roger is our director um, and we, uh, we run Equilateral. We uh, basically do film production and post-production. Um, we do a lot of work with uh, ad agencies and clients directly. Um, we work mostly on uh, TV commercials and brand videos uh, that, you know, we do a lot of work with brands like Frito-Lay to smaller brands like um, there's a, a dog food brand that we are going to uh, shoot something with them and a bunch of dogs as soon as we're able to get out and shoot again. <laughs> But yeah, so I run kind of the day to day, and then Roger uh, oversees most of basically the creative uh, of, of shoots and editing, and, and yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So, can you guys tell us a little bit about your background, kind of leading up to what you do now? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I started out in photography actually when I was a senior in college. I started assisting and apprenticing for commercial photographers in Dallas and basically driving from Denton to Dallas um, a couple times a week. And then when I graduated, I went full time as an apprentice under two particular photographers. One was commercial and one was in the catalog side. Um, and you can think of catalog side as what used to be like a print catalog from Neiman's or Pennies or something like that. We did like beds, nightstands and mirrors, you know, just stuff like that. Um, and then whenever that industry started to shift to more of an internal model, so a lot of these companies like Neiman's and Pennies, they have in-house photographers now who do all that stuff. I transitioned out of photography and into cinematography, so I worked as a, an assistant and a PA on motion productions uh, or film productions, and then worked my way up to being a cinematographer, and then started a company and worked my way up to being a director. Awesome. What about you, Jessica? So I was an art major in college and I knew I wanted to be in a creative field. Um, I didn't know about this advertising field at all, honestly. And I just kind of fell into the industry. I got a, uh, a job at a post-production house. So editing uh, TV commercials, color, audio mix, all that basically after something's filmed final post-production of it that's what this company did and I worked there for eight years um, learned the ropes of, of the industry and decided to go freelance after those eight years and I was a freelance producer for about two or three years and I worked on all kinds of projects during that time and I saw how other companies because I was freelance I got to work with a lot of different companies I saw how everyone ran their companies and I just thought to myself, I could do this and feel like I could do it better. And so that's kind of what helped make the next step, the next leap uh, into what I want to do this for myself. And Roger and I partnered at that time. We're actually also married. That's why we're here together and not social distancing from each other. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, uh, he, he joked all the time that he was like, I'm going to steal you from that post-production house that you, where you work. I'm going to steal you, and you're going to come work with me. And I was like, you're crazy. That would never happen. Why would I ever leave my full-time job with benefits? Um, but he, he was right. I was, I, it just took me some time. It took me a couple of years. And, and I was, uh, the more I thought about it, the more I uh, wanted to do it and got very excited about running my own company. Um, and so we partnered, I guess it's been about three years now. It's been four years. Four years. And so, yeah, we've, we've done so much in four years. I mean, we've worked on, uh, we actually just recently produced Frito-Lay's national broadcast TV uh, commercial that um, was the COVID-19 response commercial. So it played during Good Morning America, played all across the U.S. It's actually going um, international now. The Central and South America and the UK want to use this commercial because it's doing so well here in the US. So yeah, we've done a lot in four years. That's um, awesome. It's been, it's been great. It's been fun. Can you, so since you guys kind of run your own business like that, uh, I always, and Chris and, uh, and Tim can agree, we try to talk about the wide variety of different jobs kind of in this industry. Can you guys kind of elaborate a little bit on uh, some of the different positions you guys hire for, either just full-time at uh, Equilateral or for like a specific gig? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess each production uh, is a little bit different and requires a couple of different things. Um, but there is a huge, huge, huge array of positions available. A traditional production production would have PAs, um, so that's sort of like an entrance position. So a lot of you, like coming out of school, you could probably pretty quickly get a job on set as a PA, and that's where you initially start learning. Um, and PA just stands for production assistant. You kind of do like any any little job that needs to be done. You run errands. You pick up things for other departments. And then once you move up from there, you kind of get into the different departments. So you have um, camera department, which is usually going to be, let's say, like assistant cameras, the DP, which is director of photography. Um, sometimes, depending on the shoot that you're on, you might have a camera operator uh, or a steady cam operator. So like a lot of shoots that we're on, um, even if I were DPing and directing, I would not operate the camera. So we would hire an, an operator who would have a steady cam rig or a Moby rig, or maybe they're just operating, you know, on sticks or a dolly or something like that. Um, another department is grip electric. So in grip electric, you have grips. They're the ones putting up all the, the rigging and stands and helping the gaffer, who is sort of the head of the grip electric department, uh, set up the lights and do all that stuff. And then under, under each of those, so you have like a key grip. That's the person in charge of all the grips. You have the gaffer. That's the person in charge of all the electricians or the lighting technicians. And then under them, you have like a best boy, which is sort of their right-hand man who's helping them to problem solve and come up with strategies. And then you have like the grips underneath that. Um, in production department, you have somebody like Jess, who is executive producer. So she's overseeing the entire thing. Uh, and then under her, you might have a line producer, a production coordinator, a production manager. These are all people who are helping manage the crew, crew up the job, manage the money, the budget, what money gets spent on, um, how to strategize those dollars properly. And the production team works closely with me, typically the director, because we're sort of at the top making all these different decisions on what we need to spend the budget on, where we need to be doing this, this shoot. Um, and then, of course, my position, the director position, you can just imagine that as collaborating with the agency creatives. So typically ad agencies come to us and say, hey, we want to produce this commercial. Here's the script. And then I take that script and start to strategize creatively on how that becomes images. What are we seeing? What are we going to show? Um, where are we going to film? Is it in a house? Is it in someone's backyard? Is it both? Uh, depending on the commercial, the product, how to best showcase that product. Um, so there's a lot of like creative side of the brain uh, for the director, but also a lot of just team management and mm -hmm. answering questions. Um, so it's really 50% creative and 50% uh, supervising. How, how many uh, freelance people do you guys typically hire out per job? All of those people he listed would be freelance. Oh, they're all freelance, so, okay. Yeah, so and, uh, there are so many positions on a shoot that it's hard to kind of even list them all. I mean, there are animal wranglers uh, if you're filming with animals. There are food stylists if you're filming with food. Um, of course, there's a whole art department that is full of different types of people like props and uh, just set builders and yeah. So all of these people would be freelance. Um, they all, that's kind of how our industry is set up is crew. Um, they work for all different kinds of productions all over town. Um, uh, so yeah, everyone's freelance. And then it's, that's all the production side. And then you have the post-production side, which tends to be less freelancers in that, in that world. Like we have an editor on staff. We have one employee at Equilateral and it's an editor. And he uh, just cranks out edit, editing video. Like he edits videos all day, every day. And, yeah. Um, but yeah. Good, cool. Uh, so like, let's say that somebody is wanting to get in on uh, one of the, the, the positions that, that are lower, that require less experience. How would like one of these students that might be listening be able to, what do you guys look for when you're hiring for people? Um, good communication. Um, so we, we really appreciate someone who is a very hard worker, a good communicator. Um, 
I would say, I would say those are the two most important things. Um, like how well, how quickly are you getting back to me when I call you and I say, Hey, you want to, do you want to be on this shoot? Like, are you getting back to me pretty quickly? That's a good, that's a good thing because on a set is so the, the, the PA position, the production assistant position is all about someone who's being aware of what's going on on set. And then, um, you know, who basically reacting quickly when something yeah. is needed. Like if, the assistant director is on the walkie talkie and he says, Hey, I need a, a water for this, uh, actor. Um, it's very important for the PAs to respond very quickly on, on the walkie talkie, like copy that, you know, water's on the way. Yeah. I would say like production assistant is the entry position because it's the chance to work under all the different departments. Mm -hmm. So essentially every department needs PAs involved in some way, um, just as support teams. So that's where you get to sort of learn pretty quickly which department feels most for you. You know, that's the place where you start to discover whether mm -hmm. you're interested in the camera department, whether you're interested in gaffing and lighting te technique and um, working your way up through those departments. And you see kind of pick from there. As far as like getting into the industry, it is a very networked industry in, in the sense that um, you got to know somebody is essentially the, the way it works. Um, and a lot of schools, I would imagine schools like yours probably have internship programs or things that are in place for people to get access to or information for people to get access to. And it's really best to utilize those networks to get in, unless you already know someone or have a family member or an uncle or something like that who is in the industry. That's good, that's good. That was gonna be my next question was, how do people, you know, uh, apply for those things. But yeah, so you guys are hiring people that you know, or have an established relationship with most of the time. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, I always tell someone who wants to get into our industry, um, definitely reach out to all the production houses in town and offer to work for free because that'll get you on a, on a set way quicker versus just emailing around, calling around and saying, Hey, I want to be a PA you know, I want to be paid. I want to be on your set. Like it's very, people do hire the people they trust. I mean, I have a list of PAs that are my first call that I, I call on every single shoot. And it's because I know they do a good job and I trust them. Um, so I, people will reach out to me and, uh, if, if, if they want to be on one of our shoots, um, I'll say, you can come on to our shoot, you know, on Thursday, come on out. I'm not going to pay you, but come on out. You can learn. Yeah. I can meet you. You can show me what you can do. And if you do a good job, I'll hire you on the next one. That's awesome. So I think offering to get on a shoot for free will be a good foot in the door for you to not only, you know, network and meet new people, but also show what you're made of and show what you can do, show that you're serious. Um, so and you really only have to do that like once or twice, essentially. I mean, if you go out there and prove yourself that first day, even, uh, it, it'll work out to your benefit. Right. right. But yeah, we've, we've definitely had it where, you know, I mean, for example, my first, I think three or four days on a motion production were for free. And that was after I had apprenticed under photographers for five years. Mm -hmm. So even, even in a position where I had already assisted, I already had the technical knowledge to prove myself I had to prove myself to these new people that I didn't know who were outside of my network um, and once I was able to do that then you're able to start moving up and, and you know showing people what you're made of and we've also had it where we offer that to people and then they call us on the day of and say uh, I woke up late and I don't think I'm coming out and then of course that's the person that you never call again yeah right <laughs> <laughs> um the first test and they did not and they, they failed. <laughs> exactly. Yes. You're only as good as your last job. <laughs> um, what about, can you guys kind of talk about uh, maybe the process um, from beginning to end of like a, 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 an average job that you guys might have? Kind of what that looks like, how long it takes, what's involved? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, really initially what ends up happening is an agency producer will reach out to Jessica and say, hey, we're bidding a job. Um we, here's the creative, here's the script, here's sort of the creative brief that comes from the agency. Uh, start looking at that, digesting it, and submit us a reel. 
and and usually at that point when they're collecting reels, they're probably looking at maybe ten, maybe fifteen production companies. Yeah. And then what ends up happening is they'll whittle that down. They'll look at reels and decide, okay, this these three production companies have the reel that we're looking for. So then they bid those three. So that gets to the point where Jess creates a full estimate package, um, and we have these these estimate packages that are standardized, right? So everybody's sort of using the basic same form and the basic same line items. And I'll create a treatment. Um, so Jess creates a money strategy and approach, and then I create a creative strategy and approach. And that usually comes with images, all of the technical information of how we're going to pull off this shoot, where I propose we're going to shoot it, the kind of like, we even break that down usually into each scene. This is how we want it to be lit. Um, any creative aspect you can think of as far as like, this is the kind of performance, the kind of camera movement. Uh, it's a really extensive document. Usually those, those treatment decks are about 25 to 35 pages. Um, and they include like a lot of imagery examples, stuff that I've previously shot, stuff that's inspiring to us for that job. So it's, it's basically like a production Bible that we create that everybody sort of each team will then take that treatment and live by their section of it. Mm. Um, so I create a section for art department. I create a section for camera department, lighting department it says that basically even says like, these are the kind of props we want to use. So we turn all that stuff into the agency as a package. And then they look at reels, they look at treatments, they look at how much it's going to cost them. Uh, with the different companies and then they go back sometimes and negotiate with us you know oh we only have this much money can you come down to this cost or hey we want to add this new character into the mix that we just wrote wait I can't see oh sorry Roger <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyways yeah the uh Essentially, we turn all that into the agency, and the agency chooses the one out of the three people that they're bidding that they want to go with. <laughs> and then we start moving forward on, uh, on production. So once we start moving forward on production, it becomes a very collaborative effort between us and the agency. So Jess and the agency producer are going back and forth uh, about different things, where they're going to put the money. And then I'm going back and forth with creative directors on how we're moving through the production creatively, essentially. Awesome. Then uh, we do heavy pre-pro. So in pre-production, we have our department out there buying the props. We have wardrobe stylists either creating wardrobe, purchasing wardrobe, whatever they're doing. They've got assistance. Casting. Um, we're casting a lot of times. With um, so We reach out to a casting agency, go to casting sessions, choose our actors. Um, Pre-pro probably should usually, on average, take like what two weeks, so three weeks. From the time we get the job to the time that we shoot the job, it's usually uh, two weeks would be average. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Um, there was a commercial we worked on for uh, during the Ebola crisis several years ago. Texas Health Presby. I don't know if y'all remember, but Texas Health Presby had a few cases of Ebola and they had horrible PR because of that. And they called us at 4 PM one day and they said, we need you guys to shoot in the hospital tomorrow to film a, pro a, a piece, a nice piece that shows we're doing, you know, we're, we're cleaning everything. It's safe to be at our hospital. And so we were there the very next day. That's the quickest timeline I've ever worked on was a 4 PM call the day before. And then we're shooting the next day. I remember, staying up till probably 2 a.m. that night, calling crew, like, hey, can you work on this job? Yeah. We're going into te Texas Presby, the Ebola hospital. Are you okay to go into this hospital? But and they made it worth it monetarily, I'm assuming. Yeah, yes. we all got paid. It was great. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, I had a few crew, uh, this has never happened to me before, but a few crew actually turned down the job. They're like, I'm not going into the hospital. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, two weeks is average on prep time. Two weeks... Uh, so usually you have about a week to do the treatment and the bid. Sometimes less, might just be like three days, four days, two weeks to prep, and then you shoot. And then post-production is usually around two weeks, sometimes more, just depending on how much post-production 
needs to happen? Is there any CGI or crazy graphics, motion graphics? You know, that kind of determines how much time is needed in post-production. Now that yeah. you guys have that editor, do you guys do all, like, motion graphics and stuff like that in-house? Or yeah. Okay. Motion graphics. Yeah. We do the full, we have a full post-production uh, setup, so we can do it, we can do it all. Uh, audio mix, voiceover record, color, graphics, all of it. That's awesome. Well, what is like a, what is a, a typical work day or work week look like for your editor specifically? Um, if you yeah, know, I, mean, I guess it, it varies from, from week to week, but like lately it has not been as busy. Uh, not, not a lot of advertising dollars are being spent right now. So it just hasn't been crazy busy, but we've been lucky enough to stay busy during this time. Um, so a typical week is probably like if he comes in the morning, we usually have him work about 9 to 6. So as an editor, he'll come in about 9 a.m., sits down, reads the email, gets the notes for the day. Um, any open projects that we have, which is usually on average, I would say like five to seven open projects. So he'll come in and basically he'll open up one of those projects look at his email of revisions from the client or where he's going to start. So he might come to me and say like, Hey, you guys just did this production. Uh, and I'll go over the script with him, talk to him a little bit about how I see the edit coming together. Um, he'll get started on it, you know, start splicing that stuff in. I'm usually in and out of his office, just kind of talking to him, collaborating on how the story structure is coming together. Um, so he'll go through each project, usually about three to four projects a day. He'll make revisions on, and then repost online. Um, we use Frame.io as our hosting client review platform. It's one of the more stable platforms and it's also not public facing. Um, so like hmm. Vimeo, you know, it's a public facing platform. So you have to password and hide things in different ways. Whereas Frame.io is not public facing. It's only client facing or back end facing. So. And that's important because when you're editing a commercial that hasn't aired yet, you would it's very important that you keep it private with, between you and your client. You don't want anything leaking and getting out for the public to see because it hasn't, you know, clients haven't officially approved it and shipped it for air. So it's, it's important to keep these things, uh, the, the whole editing process, um, just private, you know, you don't want to share it before your, before your, you want to your editor. Um, so when he's actually editing things, what, what programs or software is he using that like somebody that wanted to go into that position in the future? What would, what should they learn now? Sure. Sure. Um, classically, I think it's Avid, right? Like most edit places were using Avid stations and that was because you had to have an actual tech come from Avid and build you out a station inside the suite. Um, and you were assembling specific computers made to do that. Now, uh, almost everybody uses Premiere. I mean, Adobe has built such a strong set of software and Premiere is what we use. Uh, we use After Effects for all of our motion graphics and effects. And then for color, while you can do a lot of uh, color control in Premiere, it is definitely not as finessed and it's really not that great compared to DaVinci Resolve. Mm -hmm. So Basically, we build the edit in Premiere um, using ProRes, which is or, or transcodes, what we call transcodes. So essentially, we shoot uh, raw footage on a red camera, and then we take that that raw footage and that stands in the background, just in a folder somewhere, and we cut with uh, Apple ProRes. Awesome. And then we just raw replace on the timeline. So you basically just take all your ProRes clips, replace them with the raw clips, and then we spit out an XML from Premiere into DaVinci Resolve. And then we just color everything in DaVinci Resolve. And you can finish in DaVinci Resolve now. You didn't used to be able to do that, but now you can finish there if you want. So you can export your final video from Resolve. But in the edit process, what we're doing is we're taking just the video from Premiere and putting it in Resolve. So we're splitting the audio away and the audio gets sent to a sound mixer offsite. And our sound mixer does all the mixing, um, which you know, there are different levels, like what we call legal limits. For example, we were just uh, working on this with Frito-Lay and that broadcast commercial. Basically, you have to stay within certain legal limits. So the sound mixer takes all the, the sound and everything, levels voice with music and sound effects, makes everything sound great, 
and then export something that will be within the legal limits to run on social media platforms and broadcast channels and things like that and gives us back what we call a final mix. Um, and we take that mix and marry it back up with the video in Premiere and spit out our final files. Awesome. And these days, at the end of the edit process, we're typically delivering, uh, because of the amount of platforms and because ads have to reach across all of these platforms, we're usually delivering things in different formats. So we do um, 1080 by 1080 squares. We do... Squares would be for face or Instagram. Instagram. We do four by fives or uh, five by fours for Facebook feeds. Stories would be vertical. Stories are nine by 16 on Instagram. And then, uh, of course, 16 by nine. So this also is a good, a good point of reference to back up toward the production. So on production, a lot of times we're putting in frame guides in the camera that show these different crop spaces oh. that we'll have to hit in post. So we're shooting usually pretty much everything in the middle of the frame so that we can turn it into whatever crop we want later. That's awesome. I did not, yeah, I didn't realize you could put uh, frame guides in, in camera there. That's that's very interesting. Uh, two, two questions for y'all and then, then, we'll, then I'll let you go. Um, two more. Uh, let's see, can you guys talk about kind of the last big uh, still project that you worked on, what something that wasn't video, either your animated GIF stuff that we were talking about earlier, or or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. So the last um, the last big still project I would say I did was a uh, Boogaloo. Boogaloo. Yeah. yeah, it was a speaker product, um, and that that project was really cool because that was not through an ad agency, so they came to us. Uh, they basically went around the ad agency, came directly to the production company. And we helped them come up with the creative. So we hired a freelance copywriter to come on and write a script. I collaborated with him on writing that script and coming up with the concept. Um, and then we presented two things to them, which was basically we'll do a commercial for you, uh, like a broadcast style commercial that you would see, the 60 second, 30 second kind of commercial. Uh, and then we'll also do a documentary video for you that's more of like a two to three minute about us telling your story. And then we, took all the assets that we had created and broke them out into smaller little chunks that they could use on social media platforms. Uh, we created website backgrounds for them. And then we did a still photography component where we photographed the product for ad purposes, like for sellability and things like that, like push outs on social media or e-commerce platforms. And then also did a, a like a, a set of photography for them that was more function oriented, like, instructional showcasing how the device works um, and which buttons and stuff like that. And I can actually, I might be able to screen share with you 